Our sleep is one such circadian rhythm, and the hormones underlying our fundamental ability to be awake or be asleep also oscillate around that 24-hour cycle. And the best thing for that cycle is routine. So falling asleep at the same time, eating your meals at the same time, exercising around the same time every day, and then having a time where you enter a cold, dark room, ideally, and you fall asleep. And the hormone melatonin plays a large role in that. And that hormone, melatonin, is secreted in the brain when we approach our habitual bedtime, the sun sets in our environment, and we slip into our bedroom. And we fall asleep and we wake up and the melatonin stops in the morning and then we're able to go about our day. But those two processes interact and result in our fundamental ability to sleep. We are very much either in alignment or out of alignment with that circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. When we think about rhythm, in my mind, it sounds very delicate. Is this circadian rhythm disruption delicate or does it take a lot for us to be able to get off track mm -hmm. from a rhythm standpoint than affecting sleep? Mm -hmm. It really is a sensitive system. Mm -hmm. And if we, for instance, one of the most common uh, mistakes that a lot of people make is sleeping in on the weekends. And I think we um, are kind of enamored with this as a society, actually. Oh, the idea of sleeping in or the British, um, you know, a oh, lion. I think this, you know, oh, it's interesting. Almost every society has a term for this and it's always cast in a very positive light. So what that does, unfortunately, from a circadian rhythm standpoint is delaying your rising time by more than an hour will start to give your circadian system information that you have hopped in an airplane and you've flown to a new time zone and that your so your body is then going to be working actively against you the next night because it thinks that you're shifting to a later time zone your regular bedtime is going to roll around and that makes you're going to experience insomnia and you're going to stay awake mm -hmm. and you're going to watch that movie because you have this yes. burst of energy so many people in our society fall victim of this because they you know think sleeping in is a good thing you know i'm going to do that i'm going to catch up on lost sleep and up until a point if you maybe want to add 30 or 45 minutes to your 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 wake up time that's fine but really much longer than that does put you in the kind of in the risk area for what we refer to as social jet lag where we self impose jet lag like symptoms because we've in essence given our body our physiological cues that we're trying to adjust and we're kind of experiencing then jet lag symptoms often for social reasons because we often are staying up late to go out to a movie to you know, spend time with our loved ones, which are all wonderful things. But then resultingly, we'll wake up later in the next day and then maybe suffer from some insomnia symptoms the next night. What about this idea that I'll take um, my husband as an example. He's a third year urology resident. Mm -hmm. Wasn't on call last night, but he finished at one o'clock. All the surgeries got pushed later in the day. Mm -hmm. He was exhausted, but he still had to get up at 5.30 this morning. Mm -hmm. He'll go, he'll do that now for the next five days. Mm -hmm. At some point, as we just think about our lives, is there a way to repay that sleep debt? Mm -hmm. And if so, how does someone do mm -hmm. that? Medical residents are some of the most sleep deprived in our society, but they are being trained to go out into the medical field and save our lives. You know, in the case of your husband or surgeons or, you know, mm -hmm. do life-saving treatments. Um, but so often our medical professionals are trained in these environments that are fraught with sleep deprivation. And if you're a general health healthcare provider and you've come of age in the system, you know, you're probably struggling with sleep yourself if you were on a series of, of rotating night shifts. Yeah. And that is a huge risk factor for insomnia. In many cases, we find patients who are struggling with sleep difficulties, they go speak to their doctor and their doctors are prescribing sleep medications because they might be on them, them themselves or they're struggling and there is a time and place for sleep medication. But the front line for sleep difficulties is, according to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, behavior change. So for example, he wants to sleep. He wants to sleep in after that that after having four or five hours of sleep a night, would he then be able to recoup that? Well, your husband is doing something that is really challenging. It sounds like it's rotating shift work, which is the case for many medical residents. And it's part of the fabric of our medical education. But, but my team has published research in the New England Medical Journal to show that those types of schedules and sleep disruptions for medical residents are a significant predictor of medical errors. And so we really have to ask ourselves, you know, how can we set our young people up, our, you know, the people who are getting their training, especially in the medical field, 
to for success, not only for their health and their well-being, but the health of their patients also. And so what he's doing right now is rotating shift work, which is the most difficult type of shift work because your circadian rhythm can't align itself uh, with any pattern of normalcy in a typical week. So in the case of your husband, it is going to be making up for lost sleep whenever and wherever he can. He's going to so be very means, happy to hear that. Yes, please. Fully <laughs> endorse this. Um, sleeping in and also making up for lost sleep with naps. There are uh, shorter nap if he's you know he got a little bit of sleep the night before he's not you know too much in the dangerous zone of you know really falling asleep being just absolutely exhausted and if he has time for a longer nap then a 90 minute nap is wonderful in the afternoon say on a weekend if he's off to to make up for lost sleep it's interesting in the way that on one hand you want a consistent sleep wake cycle mm-hmm. is what i'm hearing you say and that is almost separate if you cannot have that yes. if you mm-hmm. are someone who does not have a consistent sleep wake cycle mm-hmm. you want to sleep mm-hmm. that would be an indication to sleep in or an indication totally. to sleep when you can totally and it, we work with a lot of shift worker populations whether it's truck drivers or medical mm-hmm. professionals and in those situations the best recommendation is to try to find to look at periods where you're maybe on a rotating shift schedule is a shorter term situation and moving into at least patterns of shifts that are predictable that is the best case scenario because our society is really powered by individuals on shift schedules outside the traditional nine to five it's how we have 24 7 access to food or customer service hotlines or medical help and attention and so we we owe our shift workers a debt of gratitude in our society, um, but their sleep really suffers. And unfortunately, we have determined that for the the risks of circadian desynchrony, the difficulties for our bodies to really repair and get good sleep, shift work has been named a, a probable carcinogen. So really yeah. moving off these schedules as, as quickly as possible and into a schedule at least of consistent shifts or ideally shifts that, that emulate the pattern of light and darkness around us where possible. I would love to hear what happens to the brain when Mm. we sleep. One of our biggest myths is that when our head hits the pillow, our brain just kind of checks out for the night and our body and we're in this monolithic state of sleep. Wrong. There's so much rich and diverse activity in the body and the brain and it changes over the course of our sleep at night. Sleep is characterized by patterns of electrophysiological activity and each of those are nuanced across sleep stages. We distinguish um, over the course of a typical episode of sleep at night between rapid eye movement sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is where, as the name suggests, our eyes are darting back and forth, back and forth. And there's a tremendous amount of activity in the brain, as much, if not more so, than when we're awake. It's fascinating. And we call wow, it, really? And we call it paradoxical sleep because there's so much activity happening in the brain and very little activity happening in the body. You're essentially immobile during rapid eye movement sleep. Other health behaviors, you have to get on a treadmill, you have to buy healthy food, but sleep can be free and start tonight. There are sleep disorders. There are more than 80 differentially diagnosed sleep disorders that are limiting many millions of Americans from getting good quality sleep. But once we can remove barriers, occupational barriers, personal barriers, cultivate healthy sleep habits, we're able to make significant gains, not only in sleep, but in daytime success, which is what we're all about. 